All right, tonight, by request, we're starting probably one of the most challenging studies you can engage in in all of the Bible. And one of the most, one of the most rewarding as well. What do you know about the Holy Spirit? Let's start with a question. And if the answer is not much, don't feel bad. Because a study of the Holy Spirit, I would suggest, is a very neglected subject. And one reason for the neglect, for the neglect is intimidation. Many are timid, intimidated when it comes to what the Word of God has to reveal about the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, there is also much confusion and in, in error taught regarding the Holy Spirit. Now, let's ask another question. What can we know about the Holy Spirit? There you go, Sister Gail. Only what God has told us. Only that which God has revealed to us through His written Word. And so to come to know in the truth about any given biblical subject, we must turn to the right source. God and His Word. And, but not just turn to the right source. We must empty our hearts and our minds of any prejudices and preconceived notions and allow the word of truth to reveal to us the truth about the, the Holy Spirit. And, and as I began looking at the lesson for tonight, and, and as, we, as I began preparing, there's so much the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit, the new, both the Old and the New Testament, and, and there's so much we can, can learn in fact, our lesson tonight will take a couple of weeks based on it being the foundational lesson. In fact, there are many ideas regarding the Holy Spirit that even brethren in the Lord's church di differ on. For example, the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. There are three or four different views, which when we come to that subject, to that area of the top subject, we'll consider all four of them and, and, and a whole host of other, other things. But... To begin with, and this is the, uh, the logical starting point, is another question. Who is the Holy Spirit? There you go, Brother Larry. It's, the Holy Spirit is God. And we have to begin here, and we begin with the affirmation that He is God, because, but many people don't believe the Holy Spirit is God because some believe the spirit, spirit is nothing more than a supernatural force, an it rather than a he. And, um, and thus they believe that there is no personality associated with the spirit. For example, and I've had, and I've had conversations with these, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and if you can actually engage them in Bible study, if you can engage them in a conversation, you've won, you've won a pretty good battle there. And, and I've got them to open up to me before on, on their teaching on the Holy Spirit. And, and they teach, and this is what some of, the, some, some of them have told me, they teach that the Holy Spirit is nothing more than a controlled force that Jehovah uses to accomplish a variety of His purposes and that the Spirit is not a person or part of a trinity or triune being. And some may think of the Spirit, on the other hand, though, as being nothing more than a supernatural specter. And I would suggest the King James Version doesn't help matters because in many places the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Holy Ghost. And again, when you think about the term ghost today, what comes to your mind? A lot of people think about like things like Casper the Friendly Ghost and, and whatnot. So in order to understand the Holy Spirit, we must begin by studying who He is. And as Brother Larry pointed out, the Holy Spirit is deity, is God. In this first lesson, which we'll probably break into two parts, we're going to look at the, the, whole, the, the deity excuse me, of the Holy Spirit from four points, as you can see on your outline. We will look at the fact that He is deity, we will look at the disposition that the Holy Spirit possesses, that is, that He does have personality, uh, descriptive attributes of the Spirit, and then finally some designative names or titles 
given to the Spirit, which show to us the relationship that He has with the Father, with the Son, and ultimately with, with mankind. And, and thus we will show that He is deity, and that He is a part of the Godhead, along with the Father and Son, which make up the one God, and with one God, or the essence of, di- of the divine nature. And so as we start our study, first of all, consider His deity. And you will note on your outline that the Bible declares that there is but one God. Moses told the children of Israel this in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 4. The Lord our God is one God. Even James said in James chapter 2 verse number 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. Now, we have to recognize that there is one God, but with three distinct separate personalities that are united. Uh, If someone would, turn to Genesis chapter 1 and read verse number 1 for us. Genesis 1, verse number 1. Thank you, Sister Carolyn. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Again, look at the fourth word of the Bible there, God. may preach that Sunday night. God there in the original is is the Hebrew word Elohim. That word is plural. Now what's the significance of that? Why do we need to know that the original word is plural? What does this tell us about God? Are we suggesting that there are multiple gods? But why would, why, would God, why would Moses be instructed to use that plural form? Yes, sir. You're, you got it, Brother Larry. Three different, three different people within the one, one Godhead, within one divine essence. Now, go on down to verse 26 while we're there. Let's read verse 26. And 27. We're not going to read all these verses, but I do want to read these while we're here to to make an important point to note this. (coughs) Who wants to read these two verses for us? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. All right, thank you, Brother Larry. Again, notice this. God said, let us. That's plural. And that tells us the multiplicity of people within the Godhead. And again, he also said, let us make man in our. Again, notice, it, notice how many times the plural, at, plural is used there. So these passages affirm that there are multiple persons within the one divine essence. The word God is... The title given in the scriptures for the one divine essence or being. And again, you know, we're tr- this, can't, this is a very deep subject. And there's so much that, you know, that just boggles the mind, does it not? That, you know, we're just, you know, we're finite men and we're trying to grasp all of this. But we, but... But God has revealed it to us so that we can learn more. So God, knowing this, knowing that this word is plural, God is a triune being. And the idea of triune is triunity or three in oneness. Or is, as is often referred to as the Trinity. And defined, it is simply 
that God eternally exists as three individual personalities, the, the Father, the Son, the Eternal Word, and the Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God, and there is but one God. Now, in the New Testament, there are three times the term Godhead is employed which affirms the unity of the divine essence. And each of these times, there are three different words, three different Greek words used that that are rendered Godhead. First of all, in Acts chapter 17, verse number 29, the Greek word theos is used, and this simply means divine or deity, simply God. Then you turn over to the book of Romans. We won't take the time to read these passages. They are on your outline. And you can study them more in-depthly in your own personal study. But in Romans chapter 1, verse number 20, the Greek word theotes is used there. Second different word. And it means divinity, divine nature, or the attributes of God. Dealing with the characteristics of God. His nature. And then finally, (coughs) and... In Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9, in reference to Christ, you know, even in the flesh, Paul affirmed that in in Christ dwelt all the Godhead bodily, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Greek word here is theotis, which which is the divine essence of Godhood or the personality of God. So in other words, in Colossians 2 verse 9, Paul affirmed that, that in Christ dwelt all the essence of God bodily. So in other words, while Christ was in the flesh, he was 100% human, but yet he was also 100% God, deity. He, he never ceased being, being God. So those are the three words that are used to, that are translated Godhead in the New Testament. And so the Godhead, simply put, is Dealing with divinity, the divine essence, the divine nature and the essence of God. Now the question is, and here's where we get to the heart of the matter. How do we know the Holy Spirit is God? And we're going to further demonstrate this from our following points. But at this juncture, how can you and I know that the Holy Spirit is deity? Well, there are several things here. points I've got on here. Number one, his presence in creation. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2, we're told that what moved upon the face of the waters? Question for you all. What moved upon the face of the waters there in Genesis 1 verse 2? There you go, Sister Carolyn, the Spirit of God. So the Spirit was there in creation. Obviously, verse 1 affirmed it, but not directly. Verse number 2 has it directly. So His presence in creation speaks to us of this fact. Number 2, His place in the scheme of redemption. And in bringing to mankind the the written word of God confirms it. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 21, we're told the prophecy came not in old time, but... (coughs) By the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved or borne along by what? The Holy Spirit. So, did the Holy Spirit have a vital role in bringing to us the Word of God? Yes, yes He did. Because, second, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of whom? Of God. You know, the, the word inspiration there is a compound word. Two, two, two words. Theos meaning God and theo, theos meaning God and pneuma me, meaning wind or breath. So the word for inspiration there literally means God breathed. Well, you know, who played the primary role in bring, breathing out the scriptures? God, but who revealed the mind of God to these inspired men? The Holy Spirit. And and, and of course, you look at John chapter 14, John chapters 14 through 16. Uh, The Holy Spirit, the promised comforter, 
Who guided the apostles into, to, into what? All, all truth. So, and, and, and so, Roman, you know, we see the work of the Holy Spirit in all of this. And that's why it's a, such an important study, is it not? It's so that we can fully appreciate who He is, what He has done. Is it, tr- is it the case, do you think, that when we talk about salvation, that we often just think of it in terms of, of the Father and Son's roles and bringing about our salvation? Does, do you think the Holy do we do we often neglect the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing about our redemption from sin? Why is that? Why do you think that is? Yeah, and we don't, you know, we don't study it often, you know, even in, in the Lord's church. And, and, and I'm glad you suggested this study, Brother Ricky, because I'm guilty of it myself. I haven't studied the Holy Spirit enough as much as I should. I had a whole class on it when I was in preaching school, a whole three, four months, a quarter of it. But then after that, you know, in the last few, several years, you know, I talk about, I, 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 I mention him here and there. But I do think we, he's, a, he's neglected when it comes to the work of God in bringing about our salvation. And certainly when it, when, when it comes to, to, the, to the nature and origin of the Word of God, we, we tend to take it for granted that the Holy Spirit brought us this precious book divine. In uh, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is God's power unto salvation. Would we have the gospel if the, if the Holy Spirit, and Spirit hadn't guided the apostles? No. So the Holy Spirit had to come upon them in order for us to have the New Testament, the gospel of Christ. You, we see the beautiful work in Acts chapter 2, do we not? And, and think about this. Let's think about this now. When it comes to back, Acts 2.38, look, look, you know, I think there's an important point to derive here. After those on the day of Pentecost said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said what? There you go, Brother Keith. Great job. Um, now, was those Peter's own words? Did those originate with Peter? Who told Peter to speak those words? The Spirit had miraculously followed them all. The yep. Mm-hmm. And they spoke as the Spirit moved them. There, there you go, Brother Keith. They spoke as the Spirit moved them. And so, in other words, baptism is Spirit commanded, is it not? Commanded by the Holy Spirit because He directed Peter to, write, to, to speak those words on the day of Pentecost. Obviously, we know Christ commanded it. And obviously, the Father commands it. So, all three members of the Godhead command it. And I think that's an important point, is it not? So, when men... Let's ask another question. <coughs> so, when men try to, ex- try to excuse baptism or try to, to say baptism is not important, who are they really speaking against? Speaking against God and the Holy Spirit, are they not? Because <coughs> the Holy Spirit through Peter says, hey, baptism is essential. You've got to be baptized in order to be saved, in order to obtain the remission of sins. And certainly, the Holy Spirit guided Paul to write what he said in Romans 6, 3 and 4, did he not? Baptism is into Christ's death, and that we put on Christ in baptism, Galatians three twenty seven. So to question baptism is to question God, but you know, and to question God is to question the Holy Spirit, who is God. <coughs> and you know, and I find it ironic. A lot of people out in the religious world say, "Well, I believe in the Holy Spirit." You know what? You know what? We can respond to them. Well, you must not believe in the Holy Spirit if you question baptism as as being essential to salvation. Does that does that mean they believe in the Holy Spirit if they question? His teachings? Oh, oh, I, 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 yeah. 
Oh, yeah, the Baptist. Because of. Because of. And it, it, you know, they say, well, you baptized because of the remission of sins. Well, again, God foresaw all the problems coming down the pike. That same word <coughs> is used when Christ gave his last supper. Remember when he instituted the cup? This is my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Same Greek word, ace, is used there. So if you're going to say ace means because of in Acts 2.38, to be consistent, what do you got to say there in Matthew 26 regarding the blood of Christ is shed because of the... Now how ridiculous... Now, how silly is that? In other words, he's saying, well, I'm going to shed my blood but it, because your sins are already remitted. Now, is that logical? Does that make any sense whatsoever? You know, I've had, some, I've had some Baptist preachers before get mad at me when I pointed out their inconsistency with that. When I pointed that out to them, they're like... They wouldn't say anything. I just told them, if you are going to use that line of argumentation... <coughs> To be, con <coughs> <coughs> to be consistent, you have to say it means because of when Christ spoke these words in Matthew 26. Can it mean one thing in one place and another thing in another? Greek language, I told you, is very specific. It is very specific. Yeah, it is. English is very ambiguous in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. as it is there. In fact, the Koine Greek, that's a dead language too. And there's a reason it's dead, so its meanings do not change means exactly now what it meant what it meant then but I think that's important to point out is it not because if men disregard the teaching of baptism they are disregarding the teaching of the Holy Spirit who 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 inspired Peter to speak those words who guided Peter to to speak those words and so the place of the Holy Spirit in the scheme of redemption speaks to us of the fact that he is God in fact he is Referred to as God, if not explicitly, implicitly. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, if someone would, read verses 3 and 4. I do want to read some of the key passages here that I think will help us understand what we are dealing with. If someone would, read these two verses. <coughs> All right, thank you, Brother Keith. Notice that. In verse number 3, we understand the sin that Ananias and Sapphira committed was lying. They, they, claimed, they held back part of the land while they claimed that they sold it all, did they not? Did, was it required on their part to sell everything? No. But they lied about it. And so, who does Peter say they lied to in verse 3? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now, come down to verse 4. He says, you haven't lied unto men, but unto whom? So, the Holy Spirit is not man. Correct? So, they lied to God, but Peter also said they lied to the Holy Spirit. See, what's, see what we're saying? So, does this not imply the Holy Spirit is God? You lie to the Holy Spirit, you lie to God. You lie to God, you lie to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. And certainly, as pointed out, John chapters 14 through 16 indicate to us the deity of, of the Holy Spirit. And you look especially at verse number 16 of chapter 14, <coughs> when Christ promised his apostles another comforter. And this indicates some important truths. When Christ promised another comforter, does this imply that, that the apostles had a comforter at that time? They had him. Right they had him. There, there you go, Brother, Brother Keith. And so this other comforter they were promised would be of the same kind as they already had, as indicated by the word another. And again, as you noted, Brother Keith, that the comforter they had was Jesus, and since Jesus is God... Then this other comforter is God. Would it not be the case? And the comforter promised was the Holy Spirit. Therefore, 
logically, you know, we're, we're working through these passages just using plain old logical common sense. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. And so that he's referred to as God. But he's also mentioned alongside the Father and Son in several passages. We see him at the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3. In Matthew 28, Christ said and given the great commission in baptize, making disciples of all nations there, ba baptizing them in the name of whom? The Godhead 3. And then, of course, Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, we see the entire Godhead mentioned there. One, one Lord, one Spirit, one God and Father of all, who is above all and in you all. I think I misquoted that last one, but you, you know what I'm saying. And the list could go on. And so these basic areas demonstrate to us the deity. They affirm his deity. Now, the, third, the three following points, which we're going to consider will further serve as evidence <coughs> for his deity. And so, we'll start tonight by looking at the disposition of the Holy Spirit. And, and when we talk about disposition, we're dealing with personality. And so when we say the Holy Spirit is a person, we're dealing with a personality. Just as Christ, God and Christ are personalities or persons. What we mean by this is, he has a will or volition which may act or be acted upon. And certainly personality, personality involves the possession of personal qualities and attributes. <coughs> and as we're going to see, he has attributes. In fact, as we pointed out at the outset, the Holy Spirit is often referred to as a he and not an it. Now what would that indicate? What, does that, what would that indicate to us if if the scriptures mention the Holy Spirit as an it, rather than he, John 14, verse 26. Would that deny his personality? Or just rather render the Spirit as nothing more than a force or a, or a thing? Think about it. Well, if you if you use the pronoun it, you're you, you've you know you're completely removing the personality from from the spirit. And again, John fifteen twenty six, Christ said He would come. That is, the the Spirit would come and bear witness of Him, that being Christ. And. Uh, so that pronoun, the use of pronoun usage there, is very important, knowing that he is referred to as he. And his characteristics affirm his personality. You would note on your outline, I have several passages. And I think I gave you the, what, what we're dealing with in each passage. The Spirit has a mind. In Romans 8, 27, he's re it's re reference to the mind of the Spirit. So this speaks to his personality. The Spirit has knowledge. Paul affirmed in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 11 that the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. The Spirit knows, has personality. He also has a will. In 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11 in context of the, of the miraculous gifts, Paul affirmed that the spiritual gifts were imparted by the Spirit as he willed. Or as he saw fit. This, this doesn't tell me that, this tells me that the Spirit's not just some inanimate object or mere force. This tells me he has, he has real attributes. He has a real personality. Further, we're told that the Spirit is good. In Psalm 143, verse 10, the psalmist affirms the goodness of, of the Spirit of God. And God is good, is he not? Romans eleven twenty two. 22. Behold the goodness of God. And so the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit loves. Romans 15, verse 30. Paul talks about the love of the Spirit. Paul talks about the love of the Spirit. And he beseeches the brethren for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. 
And he's appealing to them to, to the love of God. And so this speaks to us of the personality of the Spirit. Further, and we talked about this a couple of Sunday mornings ago in Ephesians 4 verse 30, the Spirit can be grieved. That's a feeling, is it not? You know, as human beings, we can be grieved, can we not? What causes us sorrow? What causes us grief? Death is one thing. Now, let's apply it to God. What causes Him grief? Sin. Sin. So when we sin against God, we grieve God. And consequently, when Paul said, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, when we sin against God, we sin against the Holy Spirit, do we not? By grieving Him. And again, this is a, you know, this is a feeling. And so the Holy Spirit has this feeling. And, it, and He can be grieved. He can be sorrowed. And this certainly speaks to us uh, of, his, of, his, of His personality. Now, His works affirm His personality. And we'll get through this point and then we'll put a peg there. We'll go through this very quickly. He speaks. Again, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, The Spirit speaketh expressly. If the Spirit was simply a force or an it, would He be able to speak No. Nope. But he does. Further, he testifies and he teaches. And you have these scripture references on your outline. Uh, he guided the apostles into all truth. He commands. In fact, the Spirit told Philip there in Acts 8 to go near and join himself to the chariot. The, and we're very familiar with that setting. The Spirit searches. He intercedes. He reveals. He forbids. He divides. And again, using 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, and use, given the spiritual gifts as he willed, he divided unto every man severally as he willed. And certainly his works. And then finally under this section, the Spirit's treatment affirm his personality. The fact that man can resist him, you know, reject his teaching speaks to us of his personality. The fact he can be grieved, he can be lied to, and that he can be spoken against, blasphemed. That'll be an interesting discussion, will it not? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He can be despised, Hebrews 10, 29, and the Holy Spirit can be quenched. In these two points, I think we can see we have developed the fact that the Spirit is God. Now, next week when we conclude this study, we're going to look at the description or attributes of the Holy Spirit that further show this, and then we're going to look at some of the various titles given to the Holy Spirit in relationship to His nature, in relationship to, his, to the Father, to the Son. And finally, there's some given to Him in relation to you and I. And so those are on your outline. So if you want to study them for next week, I encourage you to do that. And so we'll pick up there again next week.